Yes, we can. Yep. Very clear. Yeah, I can. <laughs> That is when you are well dressed. Thank you. Okay, good morning, everybody, and um, welcome to the second edition of our webinar. Today we'll be discussing how you can stay connected to your customers, especially in the wake of the low touch economy. So we'll be discussing opportunities that are arising from the low touch economy. My name is Vincent Asekame. I'm with the marketing team at Terragon. And um, we have um, great panelists and a, a wonderful host for today who will be taking us through this topic and um, exposing us to great opportunities for brands, for businesses, especially businesses in the FSI sector on how they can win in the low touch economy. So we'll just give about two to three minutes to allow that attendees join. And after that, we will continue with today's event.
Okay. Uh, once again, you're welcome to today's webinar. The topic again is staying connected to your customers. Opportunities arising from the low touch economy. So the webinar is um, we're, we're having a series of webinar that we we feel we can uh, propose business winning strategies for brands, especially in these unprecedented times of the coronavirus, where it's affecting a lot of businesses and um, consumers' habits are changing and everything is happening so fast. The, the idea here is for businesses to stay winning now and even after the coronavirus, because post-coronavirus era would, would be characterized by um, a new change, which is the low-touch economy. It's going to stay a little while to become the new normal. So it is part of the reasons we have um, organized this webinar to expose you to opportunities that are arising from this low-touch economy and how your business can stay winning now and after this COVID-19. We'll go quickly to introduce our host for today. He's no other person than Tunde Adeniron. Tunde is a, is a VP product at Terragon. He's a product management expert with over a decade worth of experience building enterprise software and advanced analytics products to solve problems at scale. Tunde was here with us at our last webinar and again today he's going to, um, with the panelists, do justice to today's topic. Over to you, Tunde. Thank you, Vincent. Good morning, everyone. Um, as my colleague Vincent has mentioned, today we'll be looking at the opportunities arising from the low-touch economy. Um, COVID has brought about a number of changes in the way businesses operate in today's world. And we'll be looking at what are some of those opportunities that businesses can begin to tap into. Um, before we go into the business of the day, I'm just going to give a very brief intro into Tarragon, um, our host for today. Um, Tarragon is a 10-year-old business. Um, we are for very focused on helping brands improve the interactions and the quality of intelligence that they have on their customers. And we say that we enable supercharged connections between brands and customers across Africa. Um, our domain expertise is in Africa, um, leveraging mobile technology, leveraging data. Um, and we have a presence in over five countries on the continent. We also have um, locations in the UK and Bangalore, India. Um, over the years, we've worked with a couple of interesting brand, brands um, on, on the screen. And essentially, what we do for these brands is to help them meet their business objectives, whatever those business objectives are. Acquiring new customers, reducing churn, getting some channel uplift, and so on. Um, we are able to use data and intelligence to help businesses achieve this objective in a very intelligent and cost-effective manner. Okay, so I was speaking to our data capabilities uh, and essentially the, the summary of it all is the more data you have about an individual, the better you're able to target. If you have the individual's demographic, behavioral and psychographic patterns, you know where he stays, you know the kind of devices he uses, for example. With those data sets, you can begin to make intelligent inferences. You can begin to predict certain things um, around how the user is able to interact with you as a brand and with your products and services. And that's what we help businesses achieve at Terragon. Okay, so we'll be looking at the impact of COVID-19 on Nigeria. Um, our friends at uh, KPMG have gracefully helped us with uh, this analysis, which I'll be taking us through. Um, we'll look at the macro environment and then we'll go on to look at the impact of COVID on businesses. Um, for the first time in history, the oil prices went into negative territory a couple of days ago. Um, that has severe impacts on the Nigerian economy. Um, the initial budget for oil production, for example, was about 2.18 million barrels per day, uh, but there's been a revised estimate of that to 1.7 million, of course, due to the OPEC uh, caps and things like that. Now, oil prices, as I when this document was created, was had dropped to $30, but it's way below that now, as I'm sure we are all aware. Um, this means that from a revenue perspective, the government is not going to be able to make as much money as it's projected. It then means that 
from a deficit perspective, we're we going to have to borrow a lot more. And that's, that means that we're going to have less foreign exchange earnings coming in. And of course, compl complicating that would be the increase in borrowing. And then you can see that there's going to be a lot of pressures on the exchange rates, right? Already, the exchange rate has gone up um, from 305 officially or 360 unofficially to about um, 410, 420. And it is expected um, for it to continue to go up if the crude oil price remains at its current level. So looking at the impact of COVID on businesses, um, of course, uh, businesses do not operate in a silo, right? Uh, businesses operate within the macroeconomic conditions and the institutional voids that those macroeconomic conditions present to the businesses. Um, there's going to be a number of shocks right, on, on businesses. And, and there are two main shocks that affect both the demand and supply side for businesses, um, broadly speaking. The first is the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and the second is the oil price war, which means that crude oil prices are very low. And like I explained earlier, there's a ripple impact on the economy. Um, now, there's an impact on the supply side. For businesses, for example, who import things, um, a lot of businesses in Nigeria are import dependent. Even those who manufacture import raw materials from Asia, from Europe and, and so on. Um, foreign exchange has gone up. So that means cost of doing business is gonna go up. Right now, mobility challenges around imports is a huge challenge. On the demand side, right, customer appetite is declining, right? A number of people have lost their jobs. A number of people, or rather every consumer today is prioritizing their expenses to ensure that they're only spending on the important things for themselves, what you would call essential goods, food, healthcare, and so on. Um, on the financial side, it's going to be a bit more difficult for businesses to get access to loans from banks, for example, because I would imagine that these banks will begin to put more stringent measures um, to ensure that they can mitigate their risk, right? Because everyone is going to be very cautious. Um, it's been predicted that we're going to go into a recession any time from now. Um, and, and this is going to have a ripple effect on the ability of businesses to meet up to their targets from the beginning of the year. So we could see how um, COVID-19 has essentially changed the world as we know it. January, things are looking very rosy. And now we're in April, uh, the, the outlook is not as rosy as it looked like in January. Now, what are those trends that we are seeing due to COVID-19? Um, a number of trends, of course, due to the mobility constraints, the lockdowns, people are stuck at home. So we are seeing a surge in digital transactions, right? Um, you are seeing a surge in things like streaming, um, video streaming. Um, we are seeing a surge in things like remote work. Um, one of the things, too, we are using today, Zoom, is, is, is a tool that a lot of businesses are using to host meetings. Um, of course, there are other remote um, telecommunication solutions out there that companies are also making use of, Microsoft Teams and so on, Skype and so on. Um, we are seeing that there's an increased demand for data, right? Because of course, working from home, having these remote calling sessions means that the appetite to spend on internet usage is going up. Um, of course, if you have kids at home, the kids are also learning through Zoom or some of the uh, distance learning platforms that the schools may have implemented. And it then means that overall, you, you, we are seeing a spike in internet um, usage. And of course, when it comes to bill payments, the de facto way for people to pay bills right now is online, right? Um, either online or through um, your mobile phones, USSD channels and, uh, and the like. Um, so these trends are essentially evolving the way people interact with brands, right? And what this means is that um, we are getting into what we call the low-touch economy. And this low-touch economy refers to a, a scenario where um, the communication between businesses and their customers is not going to be as it used to be in the past, right? There's going to be reduced close contact interactions. Um, due to the hygiene and travel restrictions, right? So limited gatherings, um, of course, like I mentioned earlier, on tra travel restrictions. And so, so this means that businesses would have to evolve their strategy in several ways. It will change how we eat, it will change how we shop, right? It will change how we manage our health, 
um, to change how we exercise because, for example, you can't go to the gyms anymore. You have to begin to do your exercise regimen at home. It's to change even how we socialize and interact with people, right? And of course, it's to change how we, we, we spend our free time. And this change is coming at an unprecedented um, rate. Now, we'll be looking at this topic of the low-touch economy. Um, and today, I'm joined by our panelists, two panelists uh, are here with me, um, Ryan Abdul, who is our Chief Revenue Officer at Tarragon Group. Um, he's a leading strategist with over two decades of experience. Um, he's worked with several companies um, in Africa and in Nigeria. Um, I think he's a Nigerian, <laughs> even though his passport is not, is not Nigeria. Um, and our second panelist is um, Sharaf Din. Um, he's a senior manager um, at MTN Nigeria. Um, he's going to be giving us some insights into the low church economy. Um, and Ryan would also be giving us some insights into how businesses can take advantage of the low church economy. Right, so to kick off, um, I'm going to ask a series of questions to our panelists. Um, but I'm also going to mention that uh, if you have a question as an attendee, kindly drop your question in the Q&A section. Um, as we run through the questions, I would be taking your the questions from the attendees and also asking the panelists um, so that we can have an interactive engagement, right? So please um, kindly drop your questions in the Q&A section so that we can read them out subsequently. Okay, first question goes to... Ryan, um, and he goes, the world is changing at an unprecedented scale. Um, what business model pivots do you see happening due to the low touch economy? Ryan. Well, good morning, Tunde. Good morning, uh, everyone on the call. Um, thanks very much for this opportunity to, to join. Um, yeah, this is a, it's a really interesting question. Um, you know, and every, every business that we speak with and, and on all of our own companies are, are severely challenged by this new reality. I know a lot of people talk about what the world's going to look like post-COVID, um, but I don't think there's going to be a post-COVID scenario. There's going, we're going to be confronted by these, uh, this new reality of social distancing um, and a severe, uh, uh, shall we say, headwinds in terms, of, in terms of business as usual. I don't think business as usual is the way that it is anymore. So, so when we look at what a lot of analysts are saying, um, the likes of KPMG, Accenture, McKinsey, Gartner, and so forth, um, literally every industry out there um, has got a negative outlook for the next, um, for the near term and for the long term. Um, you, look at, you look at the airline industry, for example, and it's a complete and utter bloodbath um, in terms of um, staff being retrenched, pilots being furloughed, planes being sent back to um, the leasing companies or being grounded. Um, if we have a look at the banking sector, we start seeing similar kind of similar kind of headwinds. Uh, you look at corporate banking, for example, and because of the factors that you've just mentioned, um, we see a lot of corporate banks um, coming and revisiting um, their, their loan books because in Nigeria, the, the economy is slanted very heavily to the oil and gas sector and companies servicing that sector. And the loan items tend to be um, very large ticket items. So now there's a, there's a, there's a significant structural risk in terms of the banking sector and, and banks are starting to look at how they can di diversify that risk and the, and the natural place to go to is, is the retail space. So the outlook then becomes rather uncertain in terms of the long-term impact because um, historically this hasn't been an area that we've been focusing on. You know, the only areas where we, where we do see some kind of positive impact in the, in the near term and in the and in the long term is communications, um, education sector, public sector, and, and healthcare. Those are, those are the sectors where we, seeing, um, where we are seeing an uptick. But when we drill down into, into some of these details, right? If you, if you look at what KPMG has said as well, is that, for example, 94% of Fortune 1000 companies across the globe and in Nigeria are being directly impacted by COVID. What's interesting when you look at some of the data points, it says that 71% of respondents in their CEO outlook last year have indicated that they've overlooked insights provided by their data and analytics teams because it contradicted their intuition. 
So that's a very telling, very telling statistic in the sense that the data and analysis is really driving how businesses are going to pivot. Um, CEOs and business leaders are being challenged because a lot of this analysis is counterintuitive to, to their gut feels. But what we are seeing in the, in the, as immediate actions is, is people are safeguarding themselves and their customers. They have to assess their supply risk and they've got to manage their working capital and, and, and business plans. Um, so when we, when, we look at, when we look at this kind of pivot that's happening at the moment, the broad trends are we see the shift towards online retail. Um, we already see that in, in, in the first quarter of this year. Uh, and by online retail, that can be fast moving consumer goods, that can be uh, content and entertainment, um, that can be things like even buying uh, things like airtime. We're seeing a very significant trend towards online purchases as opposed to physical exchange, physical exchange of cash. The other area where businesses are being um, forced to look at more closely is the issue of remote working and collaboration. Now in Nigeria for the longest time, we, we thought that remote working would never work. Just culturally, it doesn't, it, there's always been concerns about would this actually work? But what we're seeing in effect is that productivity um, has actually measurably increased. People are working a lot harder um, and, and companies are now starting to measure, companies are starting to measure the right kind of productivity metrics and outputs as opposed to just activity for activity's sake. Um, what we're also seeing is companies having to sustain their customer connections, right? So moving from, um, moving from an in-person customer connection to online. And even when we look at contact centers, contact centers are not operating as, as usual because of social distancing. So more and more, it is an issue of moving towards digital channels, right? In terms of customer engagement and sustaining those customer connections. Now, some of the underlying positive um, metrics that we see is that between 2017 and 2019, we saw a 56% increase in the number of internet users in Nigeria. And this, this trend continues to grow. The forecast, in fact, says that we'll have over 150 million internet users by the year 2023. So these kind of, these kind of underlying metrics give us some sense of optimism with regards to how we can sustain and how we can support customer connections during this time. Um, so, so in summary, where we see how, how businesses are, are pivoting, it's pivoting towards online retail. We see a number of FMCG companies, for example, partnering with uh, Jumia and Conga to do things like deliveries. Um, so I think that trend will continue to happen. Consumption of content and entertainment will increasingly move to platforms like, like Netflix and or any other service offerings that telcos or independent media houses um, will be having. That creates a, a great new sense and uh, sets of inventory for, for advertisers to look at in order to, drive, in order to drive customer engagement. I think within the banking sector, and then this is pretty much universal across, across all sectors, what companies are looking at is now looking at how can we assess data and how can we interpret that data as quickly as possible and see how that impacts our, our business models. And that will, the drive, that will drive the pivoting, the, the pivot uh, discussion. Tunde, back to you. All right, thank you for that response, uh, Ryan. I particularly like your point around um, remote work, the evolution of online retail, um, sustaining customer interactions through digital channels, and of course, uh, the, the evolution of content consumption to online medium. Thank you, Ryan, once again. Next question goes to the second panelist, Sharaf. Um, and it goes, in the age of the low-touch economy, um, in what ways are the telcos responding to the current happening? So I, I know you work with MTN, but you don't necessarily have to speak about it from an MTN perspective. You could speak about it from a global or a Nigerian or an African perspective. Um, what are your thoughts on this point, Sharaf? Um, good morning, everyone, and um, hope we're all keeping safe. I think um, majorly telcos are enablers at this time, and um, even when it's no COVID, but essentially at this time, it is expected that people keep communicating, both in terms of the economy or businesses, and even for our social lives to keep us, to keep us going. So one of the major things for me that I think um, telcos have to do or that are doing currently 
is to keep the network up to ensure communication. A lot of work goes into this by ensuring that um, the base stations are up, even diesel is delivered at the right time to those base, base stations and all the people behind the scene able to provide the kind of services that keeps us um, using our voice um, communication um, channel and even data. The second thing I think telcos do is to provide um, options for recharges. For you to be able to talk, that means you have to be able to recharge. So um, it's good that we've gone past the era of looking for physical recharge cards um, to load our phones. So now there are convenient channels that are being provided by various telcos to do these recharges. Another one is internet access, and this is essential because um, a lot of things are done now at days, even in ordering for pizza and stuff like that are all done using data and internet access. Also for the small businesses that are still moving around, delivering, delivering food and keeping us going, need some form of um, data to keep doing these activities. So it empowers SMEs by buying the likes of maybe MyFi's or HiNetflix, which are majorly routers that provide internet access for people to keep going. And then another one for telcos is teleconferencing. Teleconferencing is what we're using right now. It is what um, most businesses have adopted. Like Ryan said, a lot of us didn't know that we'll be able to use this um, facility as good as we're using it now. So it has kind of forced us to learn and we're using it in such a manner that it is even increasing productivity because you are in a small place, you're focusing, you're able to, you know, kill issues and meetings and move fast. Then the last one for me is education sector. And that is because um, schools have to go on. Students have resumed now, mostly from last Monday, I think. And a lot of them are looking for collaboration platforms and solutions that can help them deliver lectures or deliver classes to their students. You know, when you're using Microsoft Teams, you're using Hangouts, you're using um, Edmodo and the rest of such solutions, you need some kind of connectivity. You need data, you need devices, you need all these things to um, give to teachers and students so that they're able to collaborate and keep going. These are some of the things that um, telcos have to play as an essential part of helping the situation to um, keep the social distance. Thanks. Thank you so much, Sharaf. Um, I, I particularly like the point you raised around um, keeping the network up. It's something that has not gotten enough attention, but I imagine that it, it must be a logistical nightmare to actually ensure that these base stations have enough diesel and so on. Um, you mentioned maintaining options for recharges, uh, options that are social distancing friendly, um, ensuring that there's continuous internet access, um, teleconferencing, and in this we are seeing some telcos, for example, Verizon has made a $500 million bid to purchase uh, Blue Jeans, a teleconferencing provider. And then also in the education sector where a lot of schools rely on, on the solutions. Thank you so much, Araf. Um, the next question I have goes to Ryan. And, and, and Ryan, can you just give us a sense? Um, so we have Terragon um, hosting this webinar. Can you give us a sense of the different ways that Terragon is helping uh, businesses better position for the low touch economy? Sure, Tinde. Um, uh, and yet another another great question. Um, as as Terragon, we're a we're a, a marketing technology company, and one of the areas that we we have been working very very closely with with our customers is is looking at the underlying data. Um, I think it's it's critical that we we make data driven decision making um, in order to position ourselves to be able to take advantage. Of this new of the opportunities within within the new reality, um, we, we're fortunate enough to have partners like MTN 
and, and other telco providers that provide us the infrastructure to be able to look at the customer experience within this new digital landscape. Uh, which has been forced upon us as a result of um, so this low touch digital landscape that's been forced upon us by by this new reality. So when we when we just look at some of the broad market um, market figures, for example, uh, let me just have a look at some of the some of the things that we see happening in Nigeria, um, because this then informs what we're doing with our customers. So when we see um, internet growth, for example, and the use of social media in particular. Um, over the last year, we've seen a 26% growth in actual social, social media usage and a 35% growth in social media itself. Um, in 2018, there was approximately 110 million that was spent on online marketing and advertising, and this continues to see strong growth moving forward. What's really interesting, and we have a, we've done a digital trends report for 2020, which we can gladly share with a link to that to share that with, with all the participants. Um, is that even though these numbers continue to grow, um, the offline space is still a very significant element of our market. So we see this, this rapid growth in online, and this is driven largely by the rollout of 3G and 4G networks, the accessibility and the drop in purchase price of uh, smartphones and data enabled phones, but roughly 70 to 65 to 70% of our market is still predominantly offline. So that then poses significant um, challenges to us because when we look at the developed world, social media, online networks and, and digital and ad, the digital ad networks is the go-to channel to drive a lot of this engagement and a lot of customer acquisition. Our market is still somewhat constrained. There's a lot of education that needs to happen. I'm sure Sharuf can give us some insights with regards to actual data usage. Uh, my understanding is, is that a very small percentage of users are active data users, i.e. people who spend more than 100 megabytes of, on, on data or consume rather more than 100 megabits of data per month. That still tends to be a pretty small portion of our addressable market. So we have to look at things within the context of offline and online. And this is where we bring a lot of value to our customers because we're able to, through um, the data insights we have, uh, we're able to scope the market and identify what type of metrics and what kind of attributes exist in different parts of the country. So with that capability, we work with both FMCG companies as well as banks to drive things like data gathering and data insights. I'll, I'll give you some stats, for example, with uh, some of the things that we've done within, within the banking sector. We did a, we did a campaign for, for one of our banking customers earlier this year, and they were looking specifically at airtime, airtime top up and, and looking at airtime top up as a means to um, reactivate dormant accounts. We looked at a sample size and we were able to convert 12% of those dormant customers using airtime top up. Uh, to reactivate their accounts. What was really interesting from, from this exercise was that over a, a two week period, um, these customers that were reactivated on average spent about 500 Naira per transaction and they did four transactions um, over a two week period. So we can see that, you know, to the points we made earlier, there's continuing demand for, um, for, for data, for airtime and for being connected and, 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 being, and being online. Um, we, we did a similar exercise for one of our other customers in terms of driving new customer acquisition. And we acquired nearly 100,000 customers in the, space of, uh, in the space of four weeks. What was interesting about that exercise is that 90% plus, plus of the new customers that were acquired were acquired using SMS and USSD channels. The, the, the percentage of users acquired via um, online channels was, was less than 5%. So what we're helping our customers do is, like I said, um, doing data gathering, doing the data analysis, assisting them with customer acquisition, um, looking at the customer experience. Um, so for example, working with FMCG brands, how they can partner with the likes of Conga and Jumia to do deliveries um, during this time, online purchases, deliveries and then within the banking sector it is a matter of working with banks around um, promoting the download and registration of banking apps moving their customers towards digital channels um, helping position things like consumer loans um, i think that's going to be an area that we continue to see some growth in 
Um, and then in the, in the TMT space, like I said, we see an upsurge in demand. So helping customers with their content strategies and consumer engagement. Tunde, back to you. All right, thank you for that response, um, Ryan. Um, next question goes to Sharaf. However, before I start the next question, I, I would just like to remind us once again, the attendees, that you could drop your questions in the Q&A section um, so that we could get one of our panelists to answer your questions, right? So if you have a question, kindly note it down in the Q&A section. Um, the fourth question to Sharaf goes, telcos possess a lot of data um, which can be useful for brands um, looking to profile and reach the right customers at the right time. Um, so we all know that in Africa, the telcos um, have the, the broadest customer base um, and also have the richest data sets on customers. Right, so Sharaf, can you speak a bit to the MTN mobile advertising platform and what it can offer brands during these times? Um, thank you, Tunde. I think... Um, the major information that Telco has is um, demographic information and information on customer behavior. And um, it simply helps brands to hit the targets or to have more intelligent um, advertising or targeting for them to be able to campaign what they have for customers or um, target audience, I mean. Um, we're keeping social distance now, but I don't think we can keep social distance with our phones. I mean, it is said that um, an average person um, looks at his phone every 12 minutes, coming to about 80 times in a day, which means that a lot of things still happen on the phone. And uh, if customers or brands are then willing to reach customers in a certain way, that means this phone has to be part of it. So the information that telcos have, which is that demographic and intelligence information, like you've said before, on behavior, are those things that um, are available for brands to then um, harness to ensure that whatever advertising or information that they need to get out there is um, provided. So what have we done? We partnered with um, Terabon yourself, and it is in developing a mobile advertising platform, which can be then used to channel these adverts in an intelligent way to reach the right people. I mean, there are things that um, can be developed today for ATL, above the line communication, like billboards and adverts on TV and the rest. But there are some areas that uh, people or brands might not be able to reach if you don't use the mobile channel. Imagine trying to get something to someone in Jigawa and how many billboards will you then erect in getting such information to the person? And this is what uh, I believe is an advantage of the device that we are uh, we're carrying. So that mobile advertising platform for me is a good solution that um, brings together everything and you are able to pass information to customers via SMS or even several other inventories that um, we have or that we can leverage on. So, Okay, thank you for that uh, response, Sharaf. The next question goes to you as well. Um, fifth question. One use case with uh, low touch. So you actually mentioned that in your earlier response, I think to the second question, you mentioned that um, uh, maintaining options for recharges is one of the things that the telcos are doing. So I guess that connects to this question. So one of the use cases with low touch and digitizing transactions is with airtime top up. Um, could you give us a sense of how the sales of airtime has evolved over the years, right? Uh, not just with MTN, but across, I think, Nigeria as a whole, the four telcos in Nigeria. Um, what sort of um, growth and insights have we seen with um, the sales of airtime and data and the likes? Sharaf. Okay. Um, so telecommunication started in Nigeria in 2001. And um, we all remember the physical, beautiful recharge cards with pins. And that was the first for recharges. And of course, uh, 
It was beautiful. It came with its challenges, but then things evolved. Things evolved. And um, like we know now, even after this social distancing, I'm sure a lot of things will change. Things, uh, some of the things that we're experiencing now or doing now will dance to the world continues to move. The first one were recharges, and then we moved to logical things. That prints those recharge cards on a physical paper, and that kind of reduced cost for telcos, of course, and you're able to even push much more faster. And then we moved to VTU, which was um, virtual top up. Um, I started my career in banking, but um, I've grown up in MTN. And uh, one of the roles that I've held before was actually being the first virtual top-up administrator. And I could remember in those days how difficult it was to get our trade partners to adopt this virtual top-up uh, mode because a lot of people wanted to see the pins. They wanted to see what they were recharging. And sometimes they just didn't believe that some magic could happen and move airtime into your phone. So it was a lot of push. The targets were moving from 10% to 20%. And now everybody knows what virtual top up is. That is what we call MTN top it today. So that um, evolution also came. And then we moved to expanded convenience channels where you can now simply go to an ATM uh, and recharge, or you recharge via MTN app, or you even dial like a star 904 to recharge, you know. These are more convenient options that has now um, taken over the market. And everything is just to make it more convenient, especially in this kind of COVID period. So people are able to sit in the comfort on their, of their sitting rooms and top up their phones. So now we are moving to auto top up. And this is the discussion. Auto top up is now using like intelligence, working with the banks to see how you can automatically even top up your phone without doing anything or without uh, particularly um, taking an action at a point. So there are intelligent information that can tell you when you're low in credit. And then because of the connectivity and the fact that we're working with banks, you are able to just have uh, maybe 5,000 are accredited to your phone from your bank account. I mean, all the involvement or evolution that we have seen over time is all convenient and getting things better. Just to ensure that at a point that is critical like this, people continue to have options to recharge. So across the world, things have moved, things have evolved, and it is just convenience. It is just the way the world is moving. It is just what makes sense. Because I cannot, I can't remember the last time I scratched the card to, to, to recharge, for instance. And it's just the way the world has moved. But it's an interesting thing. We keep moving every day. We keep evolving. Thanks. Thank you, um, Sharaf. Um, the last question um, goes to Ryan. That's question six. And it goes, um, so as Sharaf has mentioned, um, MCN and Tragon have come together to offer banks um, and other airtime vending businesses, right? A, a new way to, to um, vend airtime that relies on data and intelligence. Um, Ryan, how, how can brands, so for brands that are on this call that are interested in tapping into this opportunity, how, how can they do so? Uh, thanks, Tunde. Um, yeah. You know, when we when we look at the market, I, I always like to think of things from a from a demand perspective, right? So we've we've definitely seen an, an increased demand because just because of the sheer numbers of people that are now um, that that have access to a data enabled phone and have access to a smartphone, um, and people want to consume services. So when we understand that connection between services and the need to be online it helps us to drive this discussion. So in order to consume things like Netflix, YouTube, social media, all these kind of things, I need airtime on my, on my device. I need, or airtime on my account, so that airtime is either voice 
uh, well, it's definitely data airtime to consume these things. When we have a look at what banks are doing in terms of moving um, consumers to digital channels because of the new reality, once again, we have this requirement that people that people have data. I, I don't know if anyone is, is it's like me, if my, I have a psychological barrier that if my airtime gets to a certain level or drops below a certain level, I then frantically try to get my, my line topped up. Um, and then it's, it's either sending someone to go and get airtime or that was back in the day, but now it's definitely using uh, mobile banking and, um, and, and VTU channels. But that is still a rather laborious exercise because I've got to monitor what my airtime balance is. I then have to go and take an action, i.e. dial a USSD string or go into my mobile banking app or go into the MTN app. And what we're finding is that if we can reduce the clumsiness of that transaction and actually automate that and simplify that transaction and have it in a sense where users have the peace of mind that when my airtime drops to a certain level, I give my bank an instruction to automatically top it up by a predetermined or pre-agreed denomination. I never really have to worry about airtime. Now this can happen in a number of, in a number of ways. You know, um, the most convenient way where there's the least number of steps and, and, and clumsiness involved is to have a standing order with, with my bank. Um, what the, the great news for banks is you now dramatically increase your, your share of wallet in terms of these airtime purchases. And when you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and they looked at this a couple of years ago, at the base of Maslow's hierarchy, they actually added Wi-Fi as one of our basic needs, right? Or access to data. So for banks, it's a great example, it's a, it's a great use case to help drive up transactional values and volumes and also to increase and also to increase um, the stickiness, the relationship with those customers. That then provides a whole new opportunity uh, through digital channels um, to be able to position um, additional products. So here we can start looking at loans, be those um, nano loans, micro loans, whatever they might be. It could even be a scenario where you, the, the bank is offering credit to buy airtime itself if the user actually gets to a zero balance. So there's a myriad of different examples that we can, be look, that we can look at um, to help airtime vending businesses and banks and the telcos drive a more cohesive and, and, and sticky relationship with the consumer. And this is what consumers are looking for. Like I said, so many things that we are concerned about. There's so many things that we're worried about. The last thing we should be worrying about is something as basic as my airtime balance. And, and this offering really addresses that sweet spot right there. All right, thank you for that response, Ryan. Um, we have a, a number of questions coming in for, from our attendees. Um, again, if you would like to ask our panelists um, a question, kindly drop it in the Q&A section. Um, the first question, and before I start, any of our panelists can take up um, the questions from the attendees. So the first question I see here is, fintechs, and it's a bit long, fintechs now play very major roles in areas traditionally viewed as banking, including consumer lending, savings, investments, etc. Um, post COVID, how quickly do you see a convergence of banking and fintechs into a hybrid kind of financial service provider to the populace? Um, are there policy or regulatory issues standing in the way of this inevitable convergence? And what needs to be to be done to bypass um, this roadblock. So I, in summary, this question is talking about the impact of the local economy on the financial space, looking at it on how it affects banking and how it affects fintechs. You could say that um, because a lot of the fintechs by default have gone digital, um, they are in a very good position as looking at things from a low touch economy perspective as against the banks who still have brick and mortar stores. Um, so Ryan Sharapu would like to give us some insights on, on this question. I'm happy, okay. I'm happy to take a stab um, at that. Sharaf, did you, did you want to say anything? Yeah, please go on. I'll take the next question. Okay. Um, so yeah, so so we've we've definitely seen the the increased competition between the fintech space and the traditional banking space, and and, and obviously what fintechs have done 
um, and, and we've seen this elsewhere in the developing world particularly, is because they've developed their solutions from the ground up without any um, legacy applications or legacy infrastructure, they've been able to develop applications um, that give them speed to market. Now, a lot of these fintech companies are, um, are funded with, with international money um, because when we look at the emerging markets, we see that borrowing is, is a, one of the fastest growing sectors ac across emerging economies. I, I see a number of, a number of challenges um, in, in this space. N number one, when you look at um, privately funded businesses and especially um, foreign investment, there tends to be a limited, um, a limited time for those investors when they expect a return on investment. Um, when we have a look at education in the market, for example, consumers are still getting used to this. Uh, a lot of the fintech companies are trying to get their credit scoring models right. And there tends to be a lag between when a loan is issued and when a customer actually becomes profitable. And that tends to be depending on the type of loan and its repayment period, but that tends to be anywhere between six and nine iterations. So whether it's a weekly loan or it's a monthly loan, it takes between six and nine iterations for that user to become, to become profitable. So when we have a look at the FinTech space, I think there is a lot of pressure on that sector of the market to, for consolidation. I think we've got too many players in that space currently, um, and everybody's fighting for the same slice of the pie right so everybody's fighting with this with the same for the for the same consumer within the banking sector we can already see the the the, the ground movement towards consolidation we can just see what's happening um with consolidation amongst some of the banks like like union bank and and, and some of the others where we've seen announcements in the last two or three in the last two or three months so i can i definitely see consolidation. The fact that we've got this material headwind that's been brought upon us by COVID will accelerate that sense of consolidation. When it comes to the regulatory framework, I, I think the regulator does need to take some kind of, um, needs to take some kind of position and needs, I don't see enough guidance from, from the regulators yet at this point, but I think that will happen in the, in the near term, just because of the reality that we're facing right now. But this opportunity, the, the, the new reality poses a, a, a number of opportunities for convergence now amongst telcos, banks, and fintechs. We need to understand that we're all fighting for the same consumer. It's all going to be about um, how strong my value proposition is, how well I can do my credit scoring consumer um, on my books and make sure he doesn't pivot to a competitor, a competitor brand. All right, thanks, Ryan. Um, let's keep the questions coming in. The second question from an attendee who would prefer to remain anonymous. Um, this looks very much like an MTN specific question. Well, le let me just say it that um, even though Sharaf works with MTN, <laughs> he won't be speaking on behalf of MTN. Um, so I, I think Sharaf will just give us a very broad response to this because um, he's not speaking on behalf of MTN in answering these questions. So the question goes, with every service going digital and Sharaf's confirmation of MTN embracing that, why do we, why do we still have the telcos investing in pushing scratch card? And the person mentioned like MTN's um, star triple A hash. I believe they should push the bank's short codes to the customers because they are still the vendors. I, I, I almost believe this is a banker asking this question. Sharaf, what are your thoughts? Yeah, um, this is very easy. Thanks for the question. It's an interesting one. And uh, my answer is very simple. Um, most above the line communication or most campaign around recharges these days is never about the scratch cards. It's mostly about star 904, like uh, MTN on demand, the convenience channels that we have to recharge, the MTN top it that we just recently relaunched, which used to be the virtual top up. So there are really no campaigns around the recharge cards or the physical scratch cards. However, every business, in my view, must um, come to the realization that you have different types of customers. 
which means that you have to make provision for all types of customers. Like I said, when we started the virtual top up, we had lots of pushback from people wanting to see the physical recharge card or the pins that they want to buy from a vendor. So it was difficult for them to walk away, part with their money and not go with something. And that is why there is still the need to keep printing these physical cards. However, the focus is more on the e-charge and top it and auto recharge and those other platforms that we have. You need to understand that there are some customers that just won't let go easily. So with time, we continue to increase the number of people that we have not, that, were, that, that are now used to the e-top-up options while we decrease the recharge, um, physical recharge options but you still have to make that provision for customers we, who won't move. My, my grandmother, for instance, will just like to see that pin, you know, wear her glasses and then put in the pin and then move on. While people like you and I don't even want to press any button, just have auto pop up in our account. And I believe um, that is the reason why those options are still available. Okay, thank you um, so much, Sharaf. Um, for the sake of time, we can only afford to take one more question. We're, we're quite mindful of time, and, and um, that will be the last um, question we will take. So I must apologize if we are not able to answer your questions. Um, now, the last question is, is a very interesting one. Um, and it goes, from the conversation so far, it has been more of the private sector. Don't you think there are needs in the public sector begging to be addressed, especially around leveraging digital platforms. Um, and what are the use cases for the public sector? Who would like to take this? Um, Ryan, do you want me to take it? Yeah, please go right ahead. Okay, so like I said earlier, the telecom the sector is an enabler, okay? And uh, for the public sector, what the government wants is um, e-governance. As much as possible, automate their processes, systems, and their way of doing things. Uh, the typical use cases are mostly around maybe sensors, identification of people, taxation, how can I collect taxation via mobile phones or in a much easier way? Maybe agricultural production, what is coming from where, where is it going to, who is producing what? And that kind of uh, um, those kind of activities, or even funding, like how money is being distributed to uh, people who are supposed to get it today. And uh, I think it is a gradual thing. Um, there's a lot happening in collaboration with um, government um, institutions these days because they've also come to realize that in reaching as many people as possible there is the need to go digital. So what we continue to do as um, telcos is to ensure that we collaborate with them because government is still one of the, is still the highest spender in most economies. There is no way you won't work with government in ensuring that number one, you're supporting or enable, on enabling them, or number two, you're just doing your civic duties. So there are opportunities in the public sector and um, I think with time, this will um, continue to get to a better stage where things will be even more transparent, things will move faster than they used to be. And there will probably be a time where we'll have uh, maybe national ID, ID cards on some kind of e-platform and you're able to enter some biometric information to maybe even travel. So I think we're getting there. I think it's a gradual thing. I think government of nowadays is realizing the need to partner with the telcos or with even the private sector to get things done. Okay, thank you, Sharaf. Uh, Ryan, do you want to add anything to that? Hi there. Um, I was on mute and talking to myself. The joys of okay. the joys of remote working. Um, yeah, I, I completely concur with with what Sharaf is, is saying. I think um, 
one of the things that we're seeing certainly on a, on a, on a global scale is the, the need for public-private partnership. So um, government, yes, has the, the overarching responsibility in terms of the social services. But what I do see happening, and this is certainly a number of, uh, certainly a discussion happening on a number of forums at the moment, is the change in the social contract, right, between government and, and us as, as citizens, and as well as brands, private sector, and consumers. Um, what we've seen, some research come through and some, some analyst notes come through from places like Accenture, is that in this new reality, effectively every business is a healthcare business. I think the, the importance of um, mental health, physical health, uh, making sure that we have the right kind of um, protocols in place um, because of the virus brings the health discussion front and center. So um, a government, yes, has the overarching responsibility, um, but as private sector, it is our civic duty to be working closely with government um, because we know that it's, I mean, anywhere in the world, government is not the most nimble. It's not the most innovative. We've been talking about e-government for easily for 10, 15 years, probably even closer to 20 years. Uh, this discussion around e-government has been ongoing in, in various guises and in, and in various um, different formats, and yet there's still a lag. So as private sector, I think we should be nudging government. We should be um, being an, an able partner to government in order to get these services to the areas where they, needed, where they are needed most. Great. Thank you so much, um, Ryan. Um, thank you so much, guys. Um, we can't take any more questions because of time. Um, I would allow Vincent, my colleague, give us the closing remarks. Okay, thank you very much, Tunde. Thank you, everyone. I'm um, just as Tunde said, my name is Vincent, and I'm with the marketing team at Tarragon. I want to thank everyone. I'm, I'm sure we've all had a great time here. Say a big thank you to Tunde, our hosts, and our panelists, Ryan and Sharaf. We also want to thank all our participants for taking out your time to register and to be here and for participating actively. Subsequently, we'll have other webinars where we'll discuss uh, specific ways that Terragon as a business can help you stay connected to your customers even during this lockdown, and also to discuss other opportunities that um, we have in this low touch economy. We'll be discussing, we'll, we'll be having other webinars to also discuss how we can use our products to help you to stay winning in these trying times. So um, expect our invite soonest and even immediately after this webinar, we'll be sending out a, a replay of this webinar and also a survey form so we can get your feedback on how we have done in this webinar. We'll also be sending a document on our auto top up service so you can see more on how you can use the service to um, get your customers to stay connected and even generate revenue for your brand as a financial institution. So expect our mail, expect our invites to us, and thank you once again for connecting with us. Thanks all.